Today's video is structured around a Bible study that I made and will be available at gleaningwithscriptures.com on Ecclesiastes, specifically Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Hello and welcome to Gleaning the Scriptures. Today we're going on a journey, a biblical journey, and it's going to be fantastic. We're going to be going through Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Bible study style. This particular journey takes some strength, so buckle up and get ready. Some of the information that you will hear in this video can't be accepted by all men. But if you are unable to accept all the information, that doesn't mean that you can't accept some of it. Sit back, enjoy, and most importantly, may the Savior bless you. Amen. The Bible is full of stories of people who lived great lives and not so great lives. In Judges, we learn of two of the Judges, one of them being Samson. Samson was a great and mighty judge, but he sinned pretty drastically. He married a Philistine wife, which goes completely against Torah. It ended up being his downfall. There were many sins of Samson, yet God had great mercy on Samson and continued to use him in his sin. It's because God is merciful and awesome and he uses us even in our flaws to do great and mighty works for him. We find the same thing with Gideon. After everything that Gideon had been through, at the end of it all, he still built up pagan mon monuments and a shira pole, and he and the people were ensnared by worshiping at that pagan monument. Mm. But the Lord had mercy on Gideon. The work that was done by the Lord through Gideon was still honored in that even while they were worshiping at this pagan place, God still gave Israel peace for I believe it was 40 years. I preface this because those are the stories that we like to hear. Those are the stories of comfort. People who were sinning, still sinned, and then continued to live in sin, yet God had mercy on them. What a comfort that is, that that's part of the character of our Lord. Have you ever wondered if there are stories of people who actually overcame sin and lived blamelessly? If you've been following our Job series, we know that Job was blameless, and he did not sin in the eyes of the Lord. I'm here to let you know that the Bible is not just full of those stories of comfort, but there are stories of people in the Word that lean the other way. What connects Ruth to Samuel? Samuel to Kings and Chronicles. Samuel to Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Song of Solomon. Samuel to Psalms. Ruth is a great-grandmother of King David. Samuel is about King David. King David is the second king in the line of kings chronicled in the books of Kings and Chronicles. Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, and Song of Solomon were all written by Solomon, David's son, and the third king of Israel. Psalms is a book of praise and worship songs, written mostly by David. King David is an extremely important character who God refers to as doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in one instance that happened late in life. Now, if David did a lot wrong in your eyes, but not in God's, guess whose moral compass is off as a result of the surrounding culture? David's importance as a figure of God, as king and ruler, cannot be overstated. Yeshua himself as ruler is described as Yeshua ben David, or Yeshua, son of David. 
He is also described as, for another form of his character, described as Yeshua ben Yosef. This is a play on words because his real dad's name was Yosef. Yeshua ben Yosef is describing him as the son of Joseph. Yosef, the son of Israel, who was sold into slavery. This describes Yeshua as the suffering servant who saves his people. He's not described as Yeshua ben Gideon. He's not described as Yeshua ben Samson. God chose Yeshua ben David with purpose and on purpose. David and the many pages written about him should highlight the importance to you all of his character and the mentorship God can deliver to us through him if we choose to sacrifice our moral compass and accept God's words at face value. David was an exceedingly just man. If you are able to do this, much like a fraction of the Tanakh's writings are centered on David, much of your life's flagpoles can point Godward as a result of the fabric woven into your life through David's life and the lives of those around him. Question. Before Yeshua begins his ministry, he gets up in front of the synagogue and reads from the Isaiah scroll. What he said nearly got him, but by the grace of God, thrown off a cliff. What was it he read, and what does it mean? Yeshua got up in front of that synagogue, and he said to them, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to preach the acceptable year of our Lord. Yeshua begins his ministry with the prophet's scripture describing salvation. It is half of his mission statement. Question. Now, go to the scripture he quoted, Isaiah 61, and let's read verses 1 through 3. Notice Yeshua stops halfway through the quotation. Why? And how is it related to this chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes? This is Isaiah chapter 63, verses 1 through 3. This is Isaiah chapter 61, 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of our Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. In a previous video that should be popping up on the screen, we pick through this verse and exactly how it describes his twofold mission, mission statement, if you'd like to quickly go there and check that out before continuing this video. So why does he stop halfway through? Yeshua's quotation is a mission statement, a two-fold mission statement. But Yeshua stops after the first part. Why? The first part of the mission is salvation. The second is strengthening. Yeshua stopped halfway because it was not the time to focus on strengthening. Much like the time of sowing is not the time of harvest. And the time of breaking down is not the time of building up. To strengthen one before their salvation is folly. This is connected to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 because there's that whole list of there's a time for breaking down and a time for building up, a time for planting and a time for reaping, a time for fighting and a time for rest. So with Yeshua being a great leader and the circumstance such that he is looking out over a sea of Israelite faces who need salvation. There are two groups of people, those who will be saved and those who won't. Now remember, Yeshua is a leader. 
what to do with those who will not be saved. Forget about them and damn them here and now in this life? That, we know, is not our Father's character. Of course, there are things one can do to lose all favor until repentance, such as practicing homosexuality, murder, and theft. But for those who are moral atheists and agnostics, what about them? Well, what does Solomon have to say about them? Their work is vanity, but they ought to rejoice in the work they do and lead normal lives. For like the animals, they were made from dust, and to dust they shall return. Consider, does this mean we fail to observe justice and mercy? On the contrary, and for the sake of all flesh, we are to take the lead role in administering justice and mercy with God as our leader. Without the order of judgment and mercy ruling over all people, they cannot prosper and enjoy the work of their hands. Like they are God's responsibility, they are also our responsibility. And with us as messianics, we are held responsible for the information that we receive. How is all this connected to Ecclesiastes chapter 3? To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under the sun, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it, that men should fear before him. That which has already been, and what is to be, has already been, and God requires an account of what is past. Moreover, I saw under the sun, in the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of righteousness, iniquity was there. I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there shall be a time there for every purpose and for every work. I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men, God tests them that they may see that they themselves are like beasts. For what happens to the sons of men also happens to beasts. One thing befalls them as one dies, so dies the other. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust and all return to dust. Who knows the spirit of the sons of men which goes upward and the spirit of the beasts which goes down to the earth? So I perceived that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his heritage. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? Shalom, my friend, and thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, maybe click one of the videos that are popping up on the screen. And if you think that one of your friends would benefit from this video the same as you have, consider copying the link and sending it to them as a text message. I'm sure they will be blessed by it, just as you have. Shalomi homies!